you know, like I told you earlier, every year I had a terrible job of examining 300 men in their underwear. Such a hard task. Examining. <laughs> From afar, just like right now. And you actually got the salary for this? Yes. Son is a nerd turned model turned writer turned editorial director. Her training is in statistics, of which vital statistics is only a small part. Yeah, so Mirza, you went to Manila Science, you majored in statistics. May we assume that you're a nerd? I still am, yes. So, how does a nerd become a model? It so happened that my dad was setting up the beginnings of book sale. And so book sale. our house was always full of books and magazines. So wow, you could sale. say that I read every magazine there was, mm -hmm. American magazines, yes. including all the fashion magazines. So I kind of grew up on Vogue and Glamour and Seventeen. Yes, and, and you know, um, we have to remind our viewers that in the 80s, you couldn't just go into a store and find all the magazines you wanted. Um, in in the in the dark ages, in before, the dark ages before exactly. globalization. Exactly. So we had to go to book sale and look in the bin. In fact, they were back issues. Yes. And so we would get them a few months late. Yes. But because of probably my exposure to all these fashion magazines, I harbored a secret dream at mm -hmm. the back of my mind that in those pages were you know glamorous, very enticing pictures of models and fashion, and so I had this secret fantasy life at the back of my mind. I eventually took up statistics and then I became a computer programmer, still secretly harboring that dream. I think one day I said, I'm just gonna do it. So I was actually uh, a computer programmer in charge of an accounts payable software. So okay. I wrote the code for that and I would service clients. And one day I was watching Discorama. Yes, yes the... I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Every All Saturday, the yes. Mm -hmm. And on this karama, they had some guests who were models. They were plugging a show. And they said, we have a fashion show for 22 BC. I'm like, 22 BC, 22 I know where BC. that is. Mm -hmm. So I think I said, why not? I'm going to do it today. So in the guise of a client call, uh, the following week, I went to the store, planted myself. Two hours later, <laughs> No such discovery happened. And so mm. the sales was like, can so I help you? I'm going to need to tweak my plan. Uh -uh. Can, can I help you? No, I'm okay. And I'm like just standing there. And then in walks a model agent. Oh. After two hours, he goes up to me and says, excuse me, are you a model? I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Fulfilled. I had already answer. No, but I'd like to be one. And oh. that's how it started. He asked me to come to the agency. And then the agency would uh, give me openings for uh, VTRs, as they called them, mm -hmm. which were uh, auditions in commercial agencies. And that's what got it started. You wanted to do it, so you created yes. the circumstances for your being I tried discovered. to be proactive. Yes. Yes, because you know, we always hear stories about how people are discovered yes. while shopping. Hindi naman, hindi naman pwede that. Yeah. Every single day, you expect an agent to come over and say, you want to yeah. be a model? You have to Swerte be there. Lang. Swerte lang. Buti na lang. I waited for two hours. <laughs> yeah, but, well, two hours rather than waiting for many weeks. The turnout yeah. could have been completely different. <laughs> exactly. So, it, it, it's, it's planning plus luck. Plus lying to SGV about client call. I'm so sorry, SGV. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, SGV, if you ever discover discrepancy, the yes. missing two hours, yes. I can that? pay back the <laughs> twenty <Okay>. pesos. <laughs> and so, um, any culture shock moving from yes. the corporate world yes. to modeling? It was quite an adjustment because, of course, in modeling you are valued for your looks and your looks alone. 
you know, they don't care what you have to say. Usually, okay. if there's a shoot, nobody cares what the model says. Nobody's gonna ask your opinion, like, what do you think? Okay. <laughs> in fact, when I, in the in like commercial shoots or whatever, when I did offer my opinion, they'd be like, <laughs> How could so, you stand this without, you know, <laughs> getting in people's faces and saying, listen to me? <laughs> <laughs> I conditioned my mind to believe because I had given up this alternate career in yes. IT. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot at stake. I oh had to God, make it work. You could be a Silicon Valley billionaire <laughs> now. <laughs> Using the statistics. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of uh, justify. I had to make it work. Mm -hmm. And so I had a paradigm shift and said, a model is a co-creator of a photograph. It is a creative collaboration. Yes. I am not just a static, You're not useless sure. yes. piece of driftwood. Mm -mm. I am a co-creator. And so I tried to do my part in helping create uh, art or even if it's just a commercial for whatever. And then did the people making the commercial look at you and say, oh my God, she speaks. <laughs> <laughs> some welcomed the opinion, some did not, but I just tried to not get in the way about it. Although, you know, when um, recently Inclusion. I read about how Carly Kloss, you know, mm. she's a model who codes. Yes, yes. Coding you Carly. You, you predated the coding models because you are a coder who models. Yeah. So, wait, let's, let's get a drink. Um, oh. Can we have some coffee? Oh, wow, thanks. Um, this is our assistant, oh, Gamba. You. I am sure that um, you. you must be very used to the sight of the shirtless. Yes, I worked with the shirtless <laughs> for many years. Yes, for the Cosmo hunks. Yes, every year we had a Cosmo Bachelor Bash and a Men, Men, Men September issue. Yes. And uh, part of the job necessitated... Which was a great service really to the women of this country. I apologize for the reverse objectification. No, 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 we I need know. that. We need that. Because, you know, it can't always it be just one side. It's wrong to objectify side. women yeah. and also probably men. But it was all done in good fun. And also, um, well, <laughs> I'm sorry to generalize, but they wanted to be objectified. Oh. They came to auditions. That's true, but... That might be debatable if you That's extrapolate true. it to the mm -hmm. other gender. Were they all model types or sometimes would there be types that do you not have a mirror in your house? <laughs> well, we sent word to agencies. Yes. But somehow... Were there also you know, people who just came in off the street and they heard there were auditions? Apparently so. <laughs> because, okay. you know, everybody is a beautiful body, yes. but for that purpose, for the Bachelor Bash... Yeah, the operative we term is talks. We were uh, curating a mm -hmm. certain kind of physique. Okay. So, and which involved pandesa. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. So, once in a while, there would be an applicant who you would say, oh, very confident. Thank you. <laughs> and so, some would even volunteer, do you want to hear me sing? And we'd be like, no, thank you. And then they would just like start singing. <laughs> Appreciate ah, the so, effort. So the, the, the equivalent for males is very confident. Because for, for girls, it's like yes. very nice personality. Yeah. And for males, it's ooh, very confident. Okay. As we were talking about it earlier, mm -hmm. every Pinoy man is feeling guapo. Yeah. While sadly, most Pinoy women are feeling pang. Even the most spectacular women, they feel yes. somehow deficient. And yet, you know, you take this guy that, let us just say, will not be in the in the Cosmo Hunks issue unless there, there's a radical overhaul of the, the notions of male beauty. But why is that? Why do all Filipino guys think they are hot? It's the childhood conditioning. <laughs> because their <laughs> moms told chewy. them. Is it because their moms told I them. I always you know, tell my female friends who have sons, the power to change the generation is in your hands. Correct. Do not exempt them from chores. The girls are always doing the chores. Yes, and do not and give the them a later curfew just because they're guys. Yes. Yes. Or do not say, wala namang mawawala, lalakan mo yung anak ko. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, you be respectful. Which, which leads to that Gillette ad that is so controversial. Because basically, it's telling men, don't be assholes. Exactly. And yet, it's managed to offend a yes. lot of men and women who defend these men. So, what, exactly. what will it take to change this whole culture of to toxic masculinity? We just need Which to is not a Filipino thing. Huh? It's, it's, it's all over. Yeah, we just need to keep at it. Keep dispelling notions of the toxic masculinity. Keep speaking out and correcting men when they 
utter a remark that's misogynistic or you know assholey. Yes. Speak up. Say that's, speak up, that's yes. not right. You shouldn't. You can't say that anymore. Yeah, and, and they still use the argument that well, boys will be boys. Oh, oh, nga. Nga. No, it's hard when it's, it's, it's like, going to really take the work of generations yes. of younger moms. And everyone, everyone in general, even men. Yes. Correct your fellow man and say yeah. it's not cool. Uh, kumbaga, be an ally. Yeah, and you edited Cosmo, which changed magazine publishing in the Philippines. As in, um, were there difficulties in in um, introducing its more liberal, sexually yes. frank viewpoint to the market where everyone is pretending to be shocked? Yes. Because, you know, that's, that's the thing. We're, we're all conservative, yeah. supposedly. In 97, when we launched, we understood that uh, it was something new because uh, topics about sex or genitalia even, they were only spoken about in hushed tones. It was quite taboo. Or only guys talked about it. Yes, or maybe women did to their close friends, but outwardly they had to project the appearance of being holy, conservative. Yeah, and, and, so, then, and then suddenly suddenly on the call we say, better orgasms in, yes. in seven steps or something like so that. So there's actually a staunch religious group. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the whole group or just a few members of the group. They launched a petition uh, passing kind of like a protest paper to ad agencies and people in general oh, so protesting tried, the launch of Cosmo. So they, they tried to kill the advertising. It will yes. uh, be an immoral and a force bad of the influence. Devil. Yes. And so I would come to work every day fearing, like, is this the day where people will lob a grenade at me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> for being the scourge of sin? But yes. no such thing happened. And we launched. We became successful. Obviously, women were buying. Pinais were buying the magazine. Yeah, the time had gone. We yes, selling out. And so, obviously, if the magazine was being bought, the information was needed, and you know they bought it for a reason to educate themselves. And, That's true. And so, and, and I guess it was just the right time for Cosmo to make it here because I think the late '90s were kind of a a, a watershed moment because Sex and the City. Yes. Was, was very popular here and yes. um, people talking frankly about yes we things. launched in 97 sex in the city came about in 98 yes so and so it was maybe the right the time. climate was right mm -hmm. globally although it was a bit late for us to only in the late 90s yes but come but to terms with that it did happen better late so. than never yes yes so in, in cosmo or your other publications have you dealt with um the whole culture of sexual harassment that we have yes, in this country. All the time, whenever we can. It's not always the most popular story that gets read. Mm -hmm. But we have 15 titles. There's uh, men's titles, women's titles, parenting, uh, teens. It's our mission to educate people about all these issues. And so we really make an effort. How does this issue affect your segment of society and how can we help them be more informed. It's not always the most popular story, right? But because we feel you better, alienate half the uh, we feel better population. putting it out there. So mm -hmm. in case they need it, in in case they search for the term, it will come up. Yeah, and because you know, since the the Me Too movement came about, it it's gotten us to assess um, the situation in the Philippines. And you have sexual harassment is pretty much a given here because yes. our elders have trained us to believe that it's a it's form okay. of complimenting yes. women. Yeah. Again, very, very how do we so. fix that? It, it's become so it's like It's like um, you, you, get, uh, you, you get grabbed and you're supposed to say thank you because you know they think you're hot. It's so, or, it's so regular and ordinary and frequent that it has sometimes mistaken to be the norm. And then you excuse people, they're saying, but you know, it's it's a good thing that now it's being talked about. Yes. Now you know you're empowered to you know not be like the feminist bitch who is always hating yeah, men. Yeah, it's like the the buzzkill in the room. And if if uh, harassment is normal, then let's make talking against it normal also. Yes. Know? For every instance that you experience or hear about, say something about it, speak up. We're fortunate to live in a time where when the president makes a misogynist remark, the, the media or um, people with the social media can, can call him out. And yes. we have to keep doing that. Yes, and um, we cannot stop. Yes. Basically, we just have to keep going until 
things change. And so let, let's go back a bit. I think that your having grown up among books really helped to shape your why your bigger worldview probably no? yeah my world was bigger than my actual world yes so i had like in my world because maybe it was very american and new york centric because yes. of all those magazines yes in my mind my world is new york like mm -hmm. i'm gonna move out at after college i'm gonna move out yes like, and because who's, who's because i went to book right? sale i had a similar because um, who did that then right yes nobody moved out and so I just announced to my parents one day, I'm moving out, I'm taking your electric fan, and can I borrow the driver? <laughs> They're so like, what? How, how did they take it? My mom was freaking out because my things were packed and I already found a bed spacer apartment. Mm -hmm. My dad was secretly proud. He said, mm. let her go. It will shape her character. And so I did it. And the first time my mom visited, she was like, Ano ba ito? Mga abortion clinic. <laughs> Saan ang far escape? Mm -hmm. You proved your point. Come home now. You proved your point. I said, you don't get it. It is not this a is point. This is the first step. <laughs> the next step after bed spacing will be a studio and then an apartment. And then I'm never moving back. How old were you? 20. Wow, that's, yes. that's young. After, uh, I finished college at 18. Mm -hmm. And so I had two years in SUV to save my salary of 2,200 Wait a minute, so. you were in college at 14? I was. Okay. Yes. Just bring the books. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had a nest egg. Even the concept of a nest egg came yeah, from see, magazines. See, um, I think that um, you've enjoyed more freedom than most because you planned for it. Because of those damn books and yes, magazines. They taught you that, you know, if yes. you're going to move out, you better have I used to money. read Miss Magazine as a teenager and work things like Working Woman, yes. which said save for the nest egg. Yeah. So I did that and then I, I just followed my plan according to what I read. And so maybe because I didn't know the reality, it helped me forge my own reality. Very good. Yeah. It, it sometimes, you know, sometimes uh, ignorance yes. can help. And reading. Reading yeah, will yes, save because, the world. Because if, if you don't know how it is out there, you know, there are no obstacles in your mind, yes. as in you can do whatever you want. Although, like the roommates in the bed spacer, one was I shared a room with a nurse and the secretary. There was no such thing as moving out in their worlds. It's just survival. Mm -hmm. You know, they're earning a living. The nurse, was, the nurse and the secretary were breadwinners. There's no such reality of like, wow, you're so independent and empowered. Yeah, because- For them, that's just their reality. Yes, and also because you were living as if you were in New York now. Oh, this is yes. a step and the next I'll get my own studio. So, um, <laughs> so there is some advantage to living as if. Yes. Yeah. And that is all, always something I espouse to my readers. Act yes. as if and you will be. You're yeah. not there yet. But you just pretend and then eventually the truth will catch up and you will become who you pretended to be. Yeah, so it's kind of like acting, right? Yes. You build the character from the outside in. So, um, Going back to book sale, how is it doing? Because, you know, I feel a great debt to book sale. Um, the, um, book sale sustained us during the, the darkest times of martial law when you know we couldn't get yes. a lot of book titles a lot of my writer and editor friends actually have come up to me saying please thank your dad yes. because of book sales please thank your dad we were able to read yeah growing up it's doing better than ever we have 86 branches from isabella to katabato my dad told wow. me to say that there it's doing well and it's two franchises well. is it franchised out i or? think there were some but i think in the end he decided not to anymore Okay, but book sale must live but yeah, forever. Books are actually thriving. Uh, yeah, we, which is strange because everybody says the print media Initial is fears. I think it's because the Kindle experience probably did not measure up to the that is hard true. copy experience. Although yes. I don't know if this is only true for uh, the older generation because kids are now, when they are born, they yeah, have they, a gadget in their face. They, they, they can probably, read things on their they phone. They probably have no contact play. with paper. So maybe yeah. if they're not used to it, I don't know what will happen in the next generations. But for now, books are thriving. Yes. Since the internet happened here, everyone has been saying that, you know, print publishing is dying. But I think it depends on the form. For example, for magazines, Summit Media closed all its print magazines in July of last year. I think for information such as information, short digestible chunks of information available that magazines are known for, 
all this information is readily available online and so there's kind of a redundancy everything's on your phone and yet with magazines magazines go through a fact checking and editorial process yes as in if you just google things that's how you absorb tons of fake news yes which is why we are very uh careful and strict with our editorial standards in our websites to make sure that we follow the same journalistic standards mm -hmm. so you know that if you trust the title then you are more assured of uh accuracy and so you're you work in the media do you follow the news of course you have to unfortunately it's my job to follow the news and so the minute i wake up i'm following the news and, and so a lot of things going on in the world from politics to climate change are deeply depressing very and so our show is the sanity maintenance program and so we're here to ask creative people how do you stay sane when everything out there seems to be falling apart? I know. The minute I wake up, I'm on my phone and I'm having like 10 heart attacks. He yeah. said what? He said what? He said what to me? <laughs> but you take it in stride and you try and think of how, what can I do in my small capacity of what I do to help. And so, because all I, I pick out what news is relevant, to which website, which sector of society will benefit from this news, how can it affect the moms, or how can it affect the teenager, and I try and help the editors uh, come up with angles to make them relevant to the daily lives of all the audiences that we serve. Hopefully, the readers uh, will use this news to influence the small little decisions they make in their daily lives that eventually uh, result in life choices that they make in the long run. Yeah, how much time every day do you spend on social media? According to the latest stats on my phone, around nine hours. Nine hours but a day, but then it's your job. It's my job. So, so but then, you know, it's... It's always open. Facebook is always open. and It's like living in a war zone where, yeah. you know, everyone's... Opinion is Except it's everywhere you. in the grab while you're eating. That is true. It's hard to step back and because it's such a stressor, I find myself unable to detox because like, am I missing something? Yeah, so so how do you relax after nine hours a day in the social media? How I stress eat. <laughs> stress. No, I work out twice a week. It used to be six times a week but now I've cut it down to twice a week because I traded you it for sleep. You work out your aggressions. Sleep, sleep, yes. Which a lot of people are passing yes. up because they fear missing out on something. Yes. What other anti-stress moves do you, you do? You, do you travel? Or? Yes, we travel. My husband and I travel a lot. Uh, as much oh as yeah, we and can. since you since you've mentioned the every, husband, every chance we get, we try. And you travel. once said in an interview that marrying Andre was the bravest thing you've ever done. Why is that? At age twenty, in one of those slam books. Yeah, slam one, book being the autograph book where you answered questions like, "How did you meet?" Yes. How, not how did you meet, but how when did you and where did you meet? Yes. And I would yes. always like correct it in everything. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, well, at age 20, at decided. At age 20, I said, number one, my dream was to see the four corners of the world. Number two. Have you done that? Maybe. How many corners are, well, it's round. <laughs> yeah, and then the second the thing in the slam book. To not be a wife and mother. I don't know how I knew that at 20, but maybe it was more of to have a conscious effort to not make it my default. And so it was not a priority. Uh, I would have friends who couldn't wait to get married or who couldn't wait to be moms. Uh, I, I don't think I had that deep a desire. Like I had a friend who said, I would rather die than not have children. I didn't feel the same way. You know, this is, this is going to make the, the, the people who produce magazines like Miss and Sassy very happy <laughs> to find that it their work <laughs> has really, you know, influenced people's work. life choices and, yes but yeah and so uh, marriage was not a priority in fact I think I was uh, in my mid-30s when I said to myself I'm so happy being single you know if I sure it's lonely but I have my gay best friend uh, the late JR Isaac mm. and I said if I never marry and but JR is there to be my companion for life yeah I'll be perfectly happy yes and then I met Andre, and he ruined my plans. <laughs> How did he do that? It's true what they all say, when you know, you know. So, I said, you know, the, the lightning strike, <laughs> For the, all my the bells ringing, the violins playing. 
Man, it's true. Okay. So when I met him, apart from love at first sight, cheesy as it may sound, I kind of knew. Well, of course, I had to speak to him first to get to know him a little yeah. bit. But my gut instinct told me, well, I have to marry him. <laughs> uh oh. Defying logic. Yes. And I did. I was very brave about it. And ten years later, it's our fifteenth year of being together, but tenth year, tenth wedding anniversary in September. No regrets because it's as if it's like day one. Yeah, and I always see the two of you hanging out. Huh? As in, um, I know a lot of people who have been married ten years that they, you know, they have separate friends. You know, they they have separate schedules. But the two of you, you're always together. How do you manage that? You know, without fighting all the time. No kids. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love kids. I'm the best aunt. Uh, but maybe there is a factor like maybe kids and the daily requirements of having kids will affect your relationship. But I know also people with kids who have a great relationship. But maybe the secret is just we're on the same wavelength. We truly Common enjoy each other's company. Yeah. Which is not to say that we are alike in every way. I'm very much a type A kind of person. And it's quite laid back. And so imagine when we clash, we really clash. I'm extremely punctual, even always too early for the time required. I'm mm -hmm. supposed to be anywhere, whether for a flight or a meeting. And he likes to get there in just the nick of time. Okay. Which causes many heart attacks on my part when we yeah, travel. That's stressful, together. huh? Yeah, it's I like, like to be, have to the be in the airport. airport three hours before Me checking. Too. <laughs> it's like, why do you have to be there three hours before? There could be a coup d'etat, a flood. A typhoon. It's like there's no such thing happening. You know, I right think now. it's it's because you, you know, know we grew up during martial law. It's Probably. it's the same it's the same logic that goes into I see a good book, I must buy it now. Yes. Because you know, if I come back tomorrow it'll be gone. And that's why we end up super, with more books than we can read FOMO. immediately. Yeah. It's probably why we're hoarders too. Yeah, because you know these things were not really available to us. And, and their parents who grew up in the in world during World War II, they have a hoarding complex. Oh so. yeah, they save Cardboard, string, everything. Because they're used to ration. Yeah, and also because, you know, we're used to things not going as planned. We tend to be somewhere two hours too early yeah. for... <laughs> yes, but maybe there are also people in our generation who were always tardy, so... I don't know. Well, maybe we maybe have... More um, than... Maybe we have good student complex. <laughs> <laughs> Do you okay. have a poser complex? What's that? Oh, I guess you don't. <laughs> What's that? I always feel like I'm a poser, and I've read it. It's the poser complex. Ah, you, I always you feel, feel like that I'm pretending because I espouse pretending. I always feel like, well, I'm just pretending. What if I get found out? What if they find out she can't really write, she can't really <laughs> edit, or she can't really? So this model. is this is an interesting syndrome. Yes, and I'm trying to come to terms with that. Have you had time to write? Because you know, I, I know you've won prizes for your fiction. Do you have time to write fiction? Given your nine hours a day on social media, I have to find time because it's something I really miss. The last time I wrote fiction was in 2003, yeah. and that story eventually won the yes. the Palanca. The Palanca. In 06. Yes. I have not written since then, and I think there's so much fodder in my life. Yeah, you, and then you, you can write entire books of. Uh, so many of, of all the characters yes. that you met in, in the fashion industry and fiction and so is on. the best way to disguise them a little bit so that that's true you know no it's like out um, we just changed your name a little yes. itago na natin siya sa pangalang <laughs> sa pangalang Vanessa Zafro <laughs> <laughs> yeah so since you're a planning sort of person you're very organized like do you have like a timetable for when you're your Gosh. book comes out. The death of my best friend three years ago uh, at the age of 48 yeah. and my father-in-law uh, just last year really made me come to terms with my own mortality. Mm -hmm. If 70 is the minimum, I try to be healthy but you never know, 70 is the age where people start dying. I have 19 years. Mm -hmm. I have 19 years to make all my dreams come true and I better get started. And so that is my overriding philosophy right now. I'm always racking my brain to, okay, how am I gonna carve out the time? What are my plans? I better live life deliberately so that I FOMO pa rin hanggang mamatay. <laughs> yeah, but you know, if that, that's a really good sanity maintenance yeah, program. Because life really slips you by, passes you by. Yes. So I keep saying to Andre, my husband, if parang yesterday lang when I was 22, 
Di ba ka 60 na ako? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I think an awareness that everything ends, yes. an awareness of people's mortality helps them cope with life better. Yes. It's the people who deny that they're it's ever going to Certainly the go. case for me now. And so, it also helps me not stress about the small stuff. Yeah. Because I keep thinking, will this predicament matter in five years? Maybe not. Why am I like nitpicking over yeah, it all gives the fussy? You, it's like a sense of um, a sense I've of learned to pick my battles, or you know, try and live in the moment. Not so many moments because I was so fraught with worry or stress. I didn't really uh, enjoy the moment because I was thinking of the next moment, and so. I try and be more mindful about it. Yeah, apart from your collection of short stories, you should write the Mirza Season Book of Sanity Maintenance. Because, you know, you have a Thank you fairly, for that idea. You have a stressful <laughs> life and, you know, you're you're cheerful. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, and and you're already looking forward to, you know, the, the, the next couple of decades. So. Note to self. <laughs> yes. Write not just one, but two books now. Yes.